Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Rachel Barber? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing by this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So first I'll look at the background of this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Rachel Barber was born in Australia on September 12, 1983. She had two younger sisters. She was described as shy and reserved, yet she wanted to be a dancer. In late 1992 or early 1993, Rachel's family moved to Mont Albert. This is when Rachel would meet Caroline Reed Robertson, who was four years older than her. Caroline's younger sister had become friends with Rachel's younger sister. Caroline would occasionally babysit the Barber children. In 1997, Rachel's family once again moved, this time to Bayswater North. In 1998, Rachel started taking dance classes at the Dance Factory in Richmond. On February 28, 1999, Caroline called Rachel's house at 5.24 p.m. and talked for 15 minutes. She called again at 5.45 p.m. and was on the phone for almost 30 minutes. On the next day, March 1, Rachel's father dropped her off at a tram stop at about 9.30 a.m. so she could catch the train to Richmond, which was about seven miles away. Rachel went to meet her boyfriend and his brother in Richmond. At about 10.15 a.m., they all attended classes at the dance factory. That afternoon, Rachel told one of her classmates that she was going to make a lot of money that evening. Rachel told her classmate that she would be with somebody the classmate did not know, and that she would explain what this was all about tomorrow. In a conversation with her boyfriend, Rachel pointed out a pair of $100 shoes and said she would buy them the next day. She went on to explain that she was going to earn a lot of money that night. She was meeting with an old friend of hers who was female. At around 5.35 p.m., Rachel left the dance factory and started walking toward Bridge Road. She told a friend that her father was going to pick her up at the end of the tram line. This was a break from her routine. Normally, she would catch a tram in the opposite direction. The friend offered to walk with her, but Rachel said no. Rachel was last seen 10 minutes later continuing her walk toward Bridge Road. She left her wallet in her locker at the dance factory. Rachel was supposed to return to the tram stop at about 6.15 p.m. She did not arrive and was reported missing later that evening. At about 6.40 p.m., Rachel was spotted with somebody matching Caroline's description, exiting a tram about 350 feet from Caroline's residence. On March 1, the same day that Rachel disappeared, Caroline called out of work saying she wasn't feeling well. On March 2, at about 4 a.m., one of Caroline's neighbors heard some crying, sobbing, and someone having a tantrum in Caroline's residence. When Caroline went to work later that day, her co-worker said that she was unusually quiet and appeared to be pale. She left work at 10 a.m. after claiming she wasn't feeling well. Her supervisor drove her home. Caroline called a friend of hers who owed her money and asked her to pay up, saying she needed to move some furniture to one of her father's vacation houses. Caroline called a taxi at 1.27 p.m. On the next day, March 3, Caroline called out of work again. She showed up at her job on March 4 and was there for the entire workday. On March 10, Caroline received a call indicating the police were looking to question her in connection with Rachel's disappearance. She applied for a $10,000 loan at a bank, saying that she urgently needed money to buy a car which is curious because Caroline did not have a driver's license. Six days later, the bank denied her loan. Caroline called out of work on March 11 and March 12. The police had tried to get a hold of her several times unsuccessfully and were growing impatient. They called the fire department to break into her apartment. They found her on the floor unconscious. Evidently, she had taken an excessive quantity of medication used to treat epilepsy. She was transported to the hospital. At 9.52 p.m., Caroline confessed that she murdered Rachel Barber. She was arrested for murder. On March 13, the police found Rachel's body on property owned by 
Caroline's father. It is not known exactly when, but at some point, Caroline strangled Rachel with a telephone cord. That cord was found around Rachel's neck. Caroline kept Rachel's body in her closet for two days, eventually putting in a rug and then in a large bag. She took a taxi to her father's farm, where she buried Rachel's body. The police found a number of Caroline's handwritten notes that were highly inculpatory. The notes contained detailed descriptions of Rachel's personality and physical appearance. Caroline referred to Rachel as strikingly attractive. She had a dancer's body, hypnotic green eyes, and very clear pale skin. Caroline had carefully planned the murder and body disposal. Her plan was to tell Rachel about a secret psychology study that paid $100. Rachel was not allowed to tell anybody about this study. Caroline would then drug her and kill her. She may have put the drugs in a pizza. It was clear the crime had been premeditated and that Caroline was going to take Rachel's identity. She had even called Rachel's family once before and acquired her date of birth, claiming she needed it for some type of project. Caroline applied to get a copy of Rachel's birth certificate. She was going to start a whole new life. Caroline pleaded guilty to murdering Rachel and was sentenced to 20 years in prison, eligible for parole after 14 and a half years. Caroline was released in January of 2015. Now moving to my analysis. Caroline Reed Robertson was born in 1978. She was about four years older than Rachel, as I mentioned. Caroline described her family life growing up as characterized by frequent criticism and denigration. She was mistreated emotionally and maybe physically. Her mother demonstrated a preference for her oldest sister, and Caroline was ambivalent toward her father, viewing him as controlling, authoritarian, and constantly angry. Caroline described herself as ugly, fat, unhappy, miserable, friendless, a social failure, and a nobody. She believed that she let everybody down, failed their expectations. She was a bad child and a troublemaker. Her family expected her to behave poorly. She would steal from people, so her parents' image of her would match her behavior. In school, Caroline was frequently teased and bullied for being obese. Caroline hated herself intensely, was depressed, angry, and disgusted by her own appearance. She once painted a self-portrait. It was completely black. She was diagnosed with deeply entrenched personality disorder, which tells us almost nothing about her mental health. By definition, all personality disorders are deeply entrenched, as indicated by the word personality, which is a stable set of characteristics. It does not tend to change over time. Also, there are 10 personality disorders. Caroline's disorder is never specified. Caroline adapted very quickly to prison life, viewing the other inmates as her family. A mental health professional said that there was a sad desperation in the way she adapted, suggesting that she adapted too quickly and was too dependent on the inmates and the institution. The judge who sentenced Caroline was concerned about this quick adaptation to prison, fearful that she would become institutionalized. One could argue that the judge should have been happy that she was adapting to prison considering that is really where Caroline belonged after committing murder. The judge said that Caroline was in some ways not a young woman facing trial for an awful murder, but a young child in trouble. What happened in the case of Rachel Barber and Caroline Reed? This is just my theory, only an opinion. Caroline had a strikingly high level of self-hatred. It was way beyond just low self-esteem. Over time, there was really nothing about herself she viewed as positive. People around her, like her parents and classmates, only corroborated her feelings. In essence, their behavior proved to Caroline that she was correct. She was awful. Why should she believe anything different? Caroline was desperate to be accepted. She wanted to fit in with her peers, but that acceptance would never come. With no one on her side no one to contradict those claims about how terrible she was, Caroline came to believe the claims completely. It wasn't like she thought she was worthless. She knew she was worthless. There was absolute certainty. She believed this so profoundly, with so much dedication, 
that our only way to escape was to capture the identity of an ideal figure. This would allow Caroline to start over completely. She couldn't repair herself, but she could adopt a new identity. She wanted to transfer her consciousness to that perfect entity, a person who was everything that she was not. Caroline was probably immature due to her invalidating upbringing, so she identified with Rachel Barber even though Rachel was four years younger. Caroline became obsessed with Rachel. In Caroline's view, everything about Rachel was perfect. Caroline viewed her as attractive, well-liked, and a good dancer. Rachel had a lot of friends, a well-adjusted family, and a future. Somehow Caroline came to believe that by murdering Rachel, she could adopt her identity. This was some type of fantasy that Caroline needed to believe, something that either was or bordered on delusional behavior. Caroline did not want to merely copy Rachel's behavior, rather she wanted to become Rachel. Caroline carefully developed a plan to kill Rachel, but didn't really think through what to do after that. In a haphazard fashion, she tried to cover her tracks, but was unsuccessful. Caroline's disorganization, self-hatred, and speedy assimilation to prison life managed to persuade the judge to give her a lenient sentence. Ironically, the judge was the only person in her life who wasn't judgmental. What lessons can we learn in this case? When ineffective parents and antisocial bullies mistreat somebody like Caroline, they commit a wrong against society. It is an insidious violation. The form that the damage takes is not in those parents and those bullies directly doing something dramatic and violent, but rather the person they targeted expressing that hurt and pain in a violent manner. So that person absorbs all this damage and then they push it out to other people. The victim carries the pain with them only to have that pain manifest at a later time. That is the mechanism of the harm. It goes from the parents and bullies to the victim and then back out to someone else. Someone like Rachel, a person who never hurt anybody. In this way, neglecting, teasing, and bullying are toxins that not only poison the intended target, but then they go on to poison others. All of society pays for those crimes in the form of this chain reaction. Those are my thoughts about the case of Rachel Barber. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.